Good evening. And welcome to our Christmas candlelight service. It is wonderful to gather together as we sing the songs of the season. And also uh, on this night as we have an opportunity to do something just a little bit different. Uh, I'll read the, uh, the top of the bulletin there of, of how the service is. Tonight's service is an adaptation of carols, a cantata for congregation and choir arranged by Heather Sorensen. She writes, there are certain carols that must be sung every December. These beloved carols root the simplicity of Christmas deep into our hearts during an often over-processed season. Both musicians and non-musicians alike find tranquility and hope in singing the carols that have been passed down from generation to generation. May you find peace, comfort, and joy in singing and listening to the carols during the holiday season. And so we have this mix of of litanies that some of our congregation are going to be readers of, and, and they have Bible readings, they have prayers in them, and also responsive parts, and they help us to see the impact of Christmas in our daily lives. And so as we gather together tonight, let's join together in prayer. O oh Lord our God, as we come into your presence tonight, we are grateful for this opportunity. Lord, that you have called us as your people, that you have gathered us in this place Lord God, that you have brought friends and visitors in, and, and Lord, we pray that as we seek to worship you tonight, as we go over the story that, that we've already rehearsed this weekend that, that is familiar to many of us, Lord, uh, may you uh, speak to us in, in a, a fresh way, that we may see the hope of our salvation in the birth of Jesus Christ and in what he came to do. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. And so we begin with Litany 1. Joy to the world. Our Lord has come. He is here. He has accomplished the gospel. He's a living testament that God keeps his promises. Lord, like the Holy Family on that first Christmas night, many of us enter into the Christmas season with mixed emotions. And like the first Christmas night, we celebrate in the midst of a complicated, ever-changing world. Because you are good, even, though you're, even through your birth, you remind us that you are unchangeable and that you are a faithful God. Because of this, we come today in gratitude, knowing that as far as the curse is found, your light shines. As far as the curse is found, your blessings search us out and cover us. Stripped of pride, accepting you as our eternal gift, given by God the Father. We come rejoicing. As your adopted children, your earthly adoption brought you into a world of heartache, poverty, and death. Our heavenly adoption brings us kingdom riches and life. We come Knowing that in our own Advent seasons of life, you are the promise keeper. You are the God who comes and who stays and delivers. Because of this, our hope for things to come. You are our hope when we pray in your name. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And with that, in a few moments, we're going to be singing Joy to the World. But first, your timing is impeccable, Laura. Your timing is impeccable. We're going to have this children's bell choir. They're going to play Joy to the World for us. And so let's listen to them.
Great job, boys and girls. We are going to sing, let's stand to sing joy to the world. We'll sing verses 1, 3, and 4. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Lord, it is beyond our comprehension that our royal prince, our holy Messiah, would have no place to lay his head. While we shake our heads in disapproval, we must also ask ourselves where we have not made room for him. So today, Lord, we invite you into our homes, the place where we are the most vulnerable and real. We invite you to see us as we are, with no pretense or show, to see the best and the worst of us. In our workplaces. Where tensions run high and people can be difficult. We invite you into our conflict, drawing on your divine compassion, understanding, and wisdom to resolve situations that wound us. so that you can guide us to people in need, precious souls beloved by you, and for those who struggled during the Christmas season. We invite you into our strife. Embracing you as our Prince of Peace, our mighty counselor, may every heart prepare room for you in this season and throughout the year. Amen. Infant holy, infant lowly, for his bed a cot of straw. 
to the very first call to worship, to be summoned to the stable where the curse was reversed, to have a request for the honor of your presence from the king of the nations. How can we con refuse? And so we come. In answer to your bidding, we come. With uplifted hearts and outstretched arms, we come. Joining our voices with the angels, we come. With joyful songs and happy greetings, all the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing praise to your name. Come and see the works of God. How awesome are his deeds towards mankind. And let's sing, O Come All You Faithful, verses 1 through 4. O come, all ye faithful, joyful, triumphant, words we've just sung as an invitation to meet the Savior. And yet, who can live up to that standard? These words which describe us on our best days, faithful, joyful, triumphant, also seem to disqualify us, as we all occasionally miss the mark. What about the unfaithful, the broken, the defeated? Can we also come to Bethlehem and meet the Savior? Because if we're honest with ourselves, we have all been unfaithful. We have all strayed and turned to our own way. The good news of Christmas is that Christ was born specifically for the unfaithful. He came to gather the broken, the disillusioned, the weary, and the utterly defeated to himself for healing. He breaks the power of fear and sin, and he frees us, giving us his peace. Find rest for your soul. 
These are tidings of comfort. These are tidings of joy. I heard the bells on Christmas Day Their old familiar carols play And mild and sweet their songs repeat Of peace on earth, goodwill to man And the bells are ringing Like a choir they're singing In my heart I hear them Peace on earth, goodwill to man And in despair I bowed my head There is no peace on earth, I said Hate is strong and mocked the song Of peace on earth, goodwill to man And the bells are ringing Like a choir singing Does anybody hear them? on earth, goodwill to man. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail. With peace on earth, goodwill to man. Then ringing, singing on its way. The world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime. Peace on earth, goodwill to men And the bells, they're ringing Like a choir, they're singing With our hearts, we'll hear them Peace on earth, goodwill to men
But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of his name of the Lord his God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. Because our culture pushes us to look for the extraordinary in exaggerated situations. We are prone to miss miracles that happen in unlikely places. We might be tempted to manufacture glamour in efforts to see God's hand at work. Lord, remind us that throughout history, you have chosen the underdog the unassuming, to show your greatest power. Remind us that you can be found in the most unlikely of places. Remind us that your miracles and blessings cannot be summoned by wealth, power, or presentation. In times when we lack confidence in our calling, remind us that you chose Mary, an unwed teen, to raise the savior of the world. In times when our current situation seems to disqualify us from your blessings, remind us of Bethlehem, a tiny city with heavenly fame. In, In times, times when, when we feel, feel less than. Remind us that you are the great I am. When we act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, we are in partnership with the Almighty, that you would use us to accomplish the divine is an honor almost more than we can comprehend, but we are grateful. Let us be your hands and feet, bringing miracles of hope and deliverance to people in darkness. Amen.
Now there were, in the same country, shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace, goodwill toward men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. And when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it, marveled at these things which were told them by the shepherds. Boy's trying to take his job right now. <laughs> As we continue, let's sing the first Noah.
the primary reading, our text for tonight's homily, is Isaiah 9, verse 2, which says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. To those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Brothers and sisters, when we started our Advent series, uh, which seems like a, a really long time ago, it was just, I think, three weeks ago, uh, I talked a lot about light and about the different ways that uh, we witness light in the world. And so we talked about natural light and artificial light. We talked about how, how for many of us, we can't imagine life without either of those things. Right? As we thought about God creating light in the beginning, I reminded us of, of how God did that apart uh, from something that gives off light, right? We're told on the first day that he created light and then the sun, moon, and stars come later on. I spoke of our reliance on light for sight, our reliance on it for development and growth, for communities, for industry, and, and really for survival. And as we've been working through John 1, I mentioned again earlier today that the light there is the same light that Isaiah talks about in Isaiah 9. The light that both of them are referring to is Jesus, the Messiah. And yet there's something we haven't covered yet. It's something that uh, shows up in both of them. It's really hitting me now that as I look out at you, you're in the dark, and that's what I want to talk about. The darkness. Right here, the passage is again, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Right? When scripture talks about darkness in this way, it, it, it's talking about where there is a, a complete absence of light from appearing. Right? It's not a gloomy day as most of today when, was when uh, we, there's a little bit of brightness in the sky, but, uh, but, but that's not truly dark. Right? It's not like a clear night when you drive up north or, or west or east and, and you go way out into the country and there's no light pollution, there's no more city lights, it's, it's just the twinkling of the stars and, and that seems dark to us and yet it's not darkness. The kind of darkness that the light of Jesus is breaking into is pitch black. It's the kind of weighty darkness that you only experience if you've ever been in a cave, deep into the cave without any light, or if you've been in a truly interior room without any light, any windows, or any electric glow. That's the kind of darkness that God spoke a good creation into existence from. It's also the kind of darkness that God plagued Egypt with. Right Back in Exodus 10, we read of, of how, again, there's this conflict going on that, that Moses has been sent by God to, to tell Pharaoh to let his people go, to leave slavery, that they may worship their God. But Pharaoh won't. And so the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward the sky so that darkness will spread over Egypt. Darkness that can be felt. And so total darkness covered all of Egypt for three days. No one could see anyone else or leave his place for three days. And yet all the Israelites had light in the places where they lived. Right? That darkness was a curse. It, it brought fear, and not just any fear, but, but fear of God, the one who was behind it, on the Egyptians, that they would not go anywhere. All the while, God's people, God's children, experienced his blessing of light. But you think about that, a world, a people, a life without faith in Christ is a life under the curse of darkness. People try to create and, and to use artificial lights. I'm not talking about the, the lights like this that we're going to light a little bit while later, but, but I'm talking about that, that people make and that they worship other gods, right? Or they find different things to celebrate temporarily. They put their confidence in things. They, they, they try to make the most of their lives, trying to say, well, this will, will make things better. It will make it brighter. It will make it gladder or more cheerful. But none of those are the true light that nurtures life. All of these false lights will fade and die. Right? Scripture teaches us that it's not just that these people are looking in the wrong place, but Scripture teaches us that there are enemies who are at work. The enemies of God are at work seeking to keep people in darkness and away from him. The Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel, 
of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Right? It's these spiritual forces, the devil and his angels, who do what Isaiah warns in, I, in Isaiah 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Right? That's not to say that unbelievers are, are completely at, at without fault or, or without responsibility, but there is a battle. Right? There's a battle against those who don't believe that seeks to limit the spread of the light of Jesus. And yet wherever and whenever and to whomever Jesus shines his light to give life, he gives the opportunity for the curse of sin and death and darkness to be removed. Right? Jesus being born ushered in a far more life-changing light than any light like the one that we saw last night that could surround that multitude of angels. The light, the spiritual light of Jesus' birth is something so much greater and that's because light changes things. Light allows us to see our faults. It allows us to see errors. It allows us to see the obstacles that stand in our way. But it also allows you to see the way to go and how to do things. And in the light of God, in the light of His Son, Jesus Christ, truly does change everything. 2 Corinthians 4 talked about how, uh, how we have the, the, the God of this world, right, keeping people, blinding people so that they can't see light. And yet Paul counters that just two verses later, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, by saying, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts, in believers' hearts, to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. Right? And so while the devil is blinding people, God can go right to the heart. God can get through everything. In 2 Samuel 22, David is proclaiming the Lord to be many things. The Lord is his rock. The Lord is his deliverer. He's his refuge. He's his strength and, and, and the horn of his salvation, his Savior. But in verse 29, he says this, You are my lamp, O Lord. The Lord turns my darkness into light. And so this morning, just as I said, that, that rebellion does not have the enduring final word necessarily, so too we hear now that neither does darkness when the true light appears. In Psalm 27, 1, David is also the author there. He writes, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And having that light is a sign of strength for the people of God. Where God is at work, brothers and sisters, he will bring and he will give his light. And that is why Matthew, as he begins to write about Jesus' life, he, he begins to record Jesus' ministry, that, that he is to go and preach and to heal and, and to teach, to minister. Jesus, we're told by Matthew, was fulfilling the Isaiah 9 verse 2 prophecy. Right? We're told there that he is the great light. He is the light dawning on those living in the land of the shadow of death. We live in that world where things are bad, where things so often appear and seem and really are tragic, where life is full of sorrow, and one might wonder, well, where is hope? The Lord alone offers true light, not just in his presence, not just that he lived here among us for 30 or 30 plus years, but that he also gave himself for us. And so we've looked at the reality that, that, that there's this attack of God's enemies to keep people in the dark and away from his light. We've looked at how scripture talks about God bringing the light to those in the darkness. There is hope for them. But finally tonight we look at, at how God intends for the light to lead us. Right? And, and now we're going uh, into to Luke and, and we find in Luke 1 how after John the Baptist, right? he wasn't John the Baptist yet, he was just John, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. But after John was born, his father Zechariah gives this prophecy about the mission of his son in service to the Messiah. Right? How is he going to be the forerunner to Jesus? But that concludes with these words. Luke 1, 78-79. Zechariah says, Because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the path of peace. What is that path of peace? Well, it's the way by which we believe and know that we have been made truly righteous with God. It's nothing that we've earned. It's nothing that we've done. 
God has shown his light on us and on all who believe. Now, what does that matter? Well, I invite you to join me in, in the answer part of question and answer 36 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Right, the question is, how does the holy conception and birth of Christ benefit you? He is our mediator, and in God's sight, he covers with all his innocence and perfect holiness my sinfulness in which I was conceived. So sin is our nature. It's our natural state. We are born at odds with God. There's enmity between us and Him. We are in darkness. But the work of Jesus, our one and only mediator, changes all of that. He gives His righteousness that we may be at peace with God. There is no other way to experience that than to believe in His Son, Jesus. And so I conclude my homily tonight with these words, this commentary from Dr. Philip Reichen. He says, after darkness, light. This is what it means to be saved. Salvation is like the first glimmer of dawn after the blackest night. Until we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are still living in the darkness of unforgiven sin. But when we trust him as Zechariah did, his light comes into our lives, and we are able to see our way out. Believe in Jesus. The dark night of your sin will be over, and the day spring of his light will rise in your heart. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we come before you tonight and we have continued on in this service, we we hear these themes, O God, these themes of, of joy and of light and of peace. And Lord God, we look back and, and we know that, that you brought peace through your Son. That you put peace into the hearts of, of the shepherds. That you put peace, at least temporarily, in the hearts of Mary and Joseph. That you put peace into the hearts of many who came to hear Jesus as he ministered and to be healed by him from, from sickness and, and ailments and brokenness. But Lord God, we do. We look at our world today and we see a broken world, we see a fragmented world, we see a world in which there is so much wrong, where there is war and there is conflict, where there is is great pain and and even amidst things that we wish to take one side on, Lord, there are times when we feel like we are in the wrong for taking the side. Lord, it is our hope that you would come quickly, that you would bring about an eternal peace and rest for all your people. Lord, too, we pray for peace in this world, even as you have yet to come. Lord God, in our own community, in our own church, possibly even in our own families. Lord, we pray for peace in our nation and in the nations of the world, that you would bring an end to conflict and violence and hatred, that you would bring an end to senseless killing and to the devaluing of life. Lord, come and give us hope that we might be able to share this hope even more. That others may know you and rest in you and find peace as well. Remind us that you are a God for whom your your enemies do not stand any chance. And that you are our refuge, you are our defender. And Lord, you will defend us. All this we pray in your son's name. Amen. Tonight I can see a star shine And its splendor fills up the sky It's the same that appeared And the wise men revered When hope was born this night Out upon the snowy fields There's a silent peace that heals 
and it echoes the grace of our Savior's embrace because hope was born this night. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let all of the world sing a chorus of joy, because hope was born this night. I can hear the Christmas bells ring, as softly a church choir sings. It's the song used to praise the ancient of days when hope was born this night. There are angels in this place and my heart resounds with the praise. Like a shepherd so scared, I'll rejoice and declare that hope was born this night. Glory to God in the highest, peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Let all of the world sing a chorus of joy, because hope was born this night. Gloria, Gloria, Gloria. one more litany and then uh, we'll be singing Silent Night, Holy Night and uh, as we finish that song you're welcome to, to head out the back uh, if you didn't hear my announcement this morning there are still plenty of ornaments, at least I think on the tree, feel free to grab one of those uh, as part of the, whole, the live nativity and then also in the manger underneath there are some books on, on Advent, a beautiful uh, just a, a little booklet to tell us more about the themes of that and so you're welcome to grab one of those I had this one lit before church. Uh -oh. There we go. Through this one light, our night is broken. As children of God, we share this light in a darkened world. I invite you to turn on your lights. You can just turn the top of them. May we not forget the impact of one light shining in the darkness. May we not forget the impact of one flame shared with one another. How quickly the dark is dispelled by each of us being the light and sharing the light. Lord, as we exit this evening, we see celebrations of you everywhere. When we see the Christmas lights blinking on the trees and on the houses, we will rejoice, for you are the light. When we feast on our Christmas meal and all the confectionaries, we will give thanks, for you are the bread of life. As we leave with these carols in our hearts and on our lips, we will sing with the angels. In the car, in our homes, during the mundane task of life, making each moment sacred, 
we receive you as our king. Let's stand to sing, Silent Night, Holy Night. Thank you.